Well, just when you thought our wise overlords in government couldn't make our economic situation any worse, California dares to dream the impossible dream and files a new lawsuit to stick it to freelance contractors. Hey, greetings, and welcome back once again to Categorical Imperatives. As always, I am your host, Lackey and Liberal. I want to thank you so much for being here with me today. Uh, for those of you who may be new to this program, welcome. This is a podcast where we are going to be using legal theory and moral philosophy to discuss current events as they relate to various aspects of law, politics, and culture. Now, uh, this video is going to uh, be picking up on something that I touched on ever so briefly uh, a few days ago uh, in a video that I did as part of my Today in Supreme Court History series, uh, where we were looking at the seminal Supreme Court case of Lochner v. New York on the anniversary of the day that that, uh, tr that case was heard before the court in 1905. Uh, and just in case you happen to be one of the uh, everybody who didn't listen to it, uh, I'll be putting a link to it uh, in a little card up in the right-hand corner of this video right about now. And I'm putting that there because you may want to go back and give it a listen. Uh, it, it, it's a phenomenal episode just of and by itself. But uh, besides that, uh, I touched on something in there uh, very briefly when I was explaining uh, what modern relevance Lochner may have to us today. And the example that I used was a bill out of California that is known as AB5, or Assembly Bill 5. Now, as we all know, there is nothing that Democrats care more about than looking out for the little guy. And it is precisely that kind of selfless compassion that makes them much better people than the rest of us. California's Democratic supermajority, to me, would seem demonstrative of the empirical fact that they care much, much more than the rest of us, and that makes them much, much better people than the rest of us. And, in the name of looking out for the littlest of guys to express the greatest of care, California, in their infinite wisdom, has decided to make it impossible for many of these so-called little guys to keep their freelance jobs. Uh, industries of note that are being hit by this are Uber and Lyft, uh, as well as many freelance journalists. Now, this has come to mind because since I did the video uh, on Lochner, I have been thinking about uh, not only Lochner, but about AB5. And I've been wondering what relation uh, the contracts clause of the Constitution uh, may have to do with this. Uh, it, to me, it, it seemed kind of just on the surface as though this w would be very relevant to, to this case, and it is something that is just uh, being ignored. So I've taken quite a bit of time, and I've done quite a bit of research, uh, and I really actually found a really uh, fascinating history behind the progression of the Contracts Clause uh, throughout the history uh, of our country uh, and of constitutional law particularly. And so I thought that we would take a look at the Contracts Clause and kind of look at it in the light of AB5. Now, the Contracts Clause is found at Article 1, Section 10, Clause 1, and it reads simply, no state shall pass any law impairing the obligation of contracts. Before we get too much into that, though, I do want to touch a bit on AB5 uh, and give you an idea of what it's about before we talk about how the contract clause may or may not relate. So uh, this bill coming out of California uh, regulates what is known as the gig economy uh, that is essentially freelance contractors. Uh, and uh, by regulate, I, I mean probably regulate out of existence. 
Uh, unless, of course, you are a freelancer whose job is protected by a powerful and well-funded union like the Truckers Union, who have managed to receive a full exemption. Uh, a judge has ruled that truck drivers in California are not subject to Assembly Bill 5, uh, this law that seeks to reclassify many contractors as employees. Uh, these regulations, which went into effect on January 1st of this year, uh, were drafted in response to a particular bill, or excuse me, a particular case known as Dynamex Operations West Incorporated versus the Superior Court of Los Angeles, and this created what is known as the ABC test. Uh, and to qualify as an independent contractor, you have to meet all three of these qualifications. First, a contractor must control their own workload. Second, they must not perform work within the business's primary scope of operations, and they must be customarily engaged in the occupation. Now, companies are uh, certainly trying their level best to circumvent this standard, uh, which would unravel large portions of the gig economy. Uh, workers who fail, as I said, even one leg of this test are considered employees under the law, and that is a status that entitles them to certain benefits and protections, while also imposing a long list of regulations on their relationship with their employer. So, enter Judge William Heiberger of the Los Angeles Superior Court. Uh, Heiberger did not find that the truckers specifically pass the ABC test. As a matter of fact, they most decidedly do not, but that the test itself clearly runs afoul of federal law. Uh, and he cited the 1994 Federal Aviation Administration Authorization Act, or as I like to call it, FA, which stipulates that the use of non-employee independent contractors which are commonly known in the trucking industry as owner-operators, should apply in all 50 states to increase competition and reduce the cost of trucking services. Now, businesses in other industries, though, uh, must still deal with the blowback from this law, which has caused many legal issues across the state. I think most notably would be for Uber and Lyft, who have a pending lawsuit against the legislation, arguing that their contractors passed this ABC test. Freelance workers, from journalists to translators and digital content creators to transcribers, are all finding themselves especially hamstrung by the new regulations, which, uh, for example, with journalists, will prohibit any person from submitting more than 35 assignments in one year to the same company or publication if the outfit does not hire them on as an employee. And although the law is in its very early stages, uh, companies have already decided not to hire freelancers uh, and instead are ending their contracts. Uh, Vox Media, for example, uh, which hosts a website in California that is known as SP Nation, has laid off 200 California freelancers at the start of the year, telling them that the working relationship simply made their situation financially untenable. Uh, now, uh, Democrat uh, from San Diego, uh, Lorena Gomez, a representative for California, uh, had the temerity to say, quote, these were never good jobs. She went on to suggest, rather dishonestly, I would say, that no one has ever suggested that these are good jobs, not even freelancers. Now, uh, freelance workers seem to have a very different opinion, however. Uh, just one particular example I could find was a woman named Alicia Grouso, uh, who is an entertainment journalist who identifies as a uh, political progressive and who talked with Reason Magazine and told them that the bill hurts the vulnerable groups that it seeks to help. And things are going from bad to worse for these ride-sharing companies during the coronavirus pandemic. Business is way down while legal troubles continue to mount. And on Tuesday, California Attorney General uh, Xavier Beccaria, along with the city attorneys of Los Angeles, San Francisco, and San Diego, 
all filed lawsuits against Uber and Lyft. Their complaint accuses the companies of misclassifying their drivers as independent contractors and not employees in violation of the state's law. And the lawsuit uh, is just the latest flashpoint in rideshare companies' long battle with state and local government over what rules should govern their relationship with their drivers. Californians who drive for Uber and Lyft lack basic worker protection from paid sick leave to the right to overtime pay, Beccaria said in a statement. He went on to say, sometimes it takes a pandemic to shake us into realizing what that really means and who suffers the consequences. Sorry, I, I, every time I try and read that line, I crack up. It's just such an absurd thing to say. Um, all right, let's try and push on past this. Um, Tuesday's lawsuit accuses the two companies of a litany of local uh, state labor code violations stemming from their alleged misclassification of drivers as independent contractors, including not paying minimum wage, not paying overtime, not offering sick leave and meal breaks, and not paying into the state's unemployment and disability insurance funds. Uh, and a spokesperson from Uber told the New York Times, quote, we will contest this action in court, while at the same time pushing to raise the standard of independent work for drivers in California, and they promise to continue fighting the lawsuit. Now, rideshare companies have employed a range of arguments uh, to avoid having to classify their drivers as employees, uh, which they say would be both incredibly costly and destroy the flexible work arrangements that make up uh, these app-based services appeal to many of their drivers. And Bloomberg reports that reclassifying drivers as employees uh, will raise rideshare companies' costs by as much as 20%. And uh, the companies insist uh, that their status as tech firms who only connect drivers and riders but who do not tell drivers when or where they have to work means that those offering rides on their platform do not qualify as employees under the ABC test. In a lawsuit, Beccaria et al. argue that Lyft and Uber are fundamentally transportation, not tech companies, meaning that these drivers are performing work that is core to their business and therefore their employees are entitled to all the benefits that that status entails. The passage and implementation of AB5 has been rife with controversy as everyone from porn stars to truckers have pointed out the ways that their reclassification as employees has cost them valued flexibility and income. Trying to forcefully reclassify rideshare drivers as employees will now likely be even more disruptive given to are given the dire circumstances rideshare companies find themselves in due to the outbreak of COVID-19. And one analytic firm estimates that spending on rideshare services has fallen as much as 83% during the pandemic. Uh, and this is a report that comes out of the Times. Uh, Lyft just announced that it will be laying off 17% of its workforce. Uber is reportedly considering doing the same. Now, if Beccaria's lawsuit is successful, he may end up winning employment protections for drivers while putting their newly classified employers out of business. So, uh, with that in mind, let's get to the Constitution's contract clause. So, Article 1 in Section 10 contains a list of prohibitions concerning the role of states in political, monetary, and economic affairs. As the Constitutional Convention was completing its work on prohibiting states from issuing paper money, as legal tender Rufus King of Massachusetts rose to propose, quote, a prohibition on these states to interfere in private contracts. King relied on a central provision that it comes from the Northwest Ordinance, and it reads, uh, In the just preservation of rights and property, it is understood and declared that no law ought ever to be made or have force in the said territory that shall, in any manner whatever, interfere with or affect private contracts or engagements bona fides and without fraud previously formed. 
and uh, the obligation of contract clause thus had its origins in even earlier national policy by extending to the states a prohibition that was already in effect in the Northwest Territory. Uh, in a brief debate that followed, George Mason feared that the prohibition would prevent the states from establishing time limits uh, on when actions could be brought on state-issued bonds. James Wilson responded that the clause would prevent uh, retrospective interferences only, that is to say, impairment of contracts already made. These comments suggest that the framers may well have intended to limit states in their impairment of private contracts already made. But the issue is not completely free from doubt. The words previously formed were not carried over to the obligation of contracts clause, so that the text could read as though it had prescriptive applications as well. Now, the twin protections found in Article 1, Section 10 prohibited the state from issuing paper money and, to some extent, from regulating economic affairs. That one-two combination uh, troubled the anti-federalists who feared that the two clauses operating in tandem would prevent the states from assisting the debtor classes. The states could no longer debase their currency with new issues of paper tender. In reporting why he had voted against the clause at the Constitutional Convention, uh, Luther Martin asserted that the states would no longer be able to prevent the wealthy creditor and the moneyed man from totally destroying the poor uh, through uh, the poor, though even industrious debtor. In response to the Anti-Federalists, uh, James Madison declared in Federalist 44 that the obligation of contract clause was essential to banish speculation on public measures, inspire a general prudence in, uh, and industry, and give a regular course of the business of society. Now, uh, support for the obligation of contracts clause was found in other quarters as well. For example, in South Carolina uh, and the ratification convention, Charles Pickney argued that these two limitations on the state would help cement the union by barring the states from discriminating against out-of-state commercial interests. Edmund Randolph in the Virginia ratifying convention declared that the obligation of contracts clause was essential to enforcing the provisions in the peace treaty with Great Britain guaranteed private British debts. The obligation to contract clause, therefore, uh, served a double duty. It afforded both a protection to individuals against their states and a limitation on states that prevented them from intruding on federal interests. In tone, the clause reads as a stern imperative. Unlike the next, uh, the following clauses, such as the Import-Export Clause found in Article 1, Section 10, Clause 2, and the Compact Clause found in Article 1, Section 10, Clause 3, Congress cannot override the prohibition by giving its consent to any state action that violates this provision. Uh, the brief terms of the clause, however, cover more than the endless round of debtor relief statutes that the framers had in mind uh, for the clause textually covers all types of contracts, not just debt instruments. Further, unlike the Commerce Clause uh, in Article 1, Section 8, Clause 3, the obligation of contract clause applies not only to those contracts with interstate connections, but to all contracts, even local ones. What is clear is that in the antebellum period, the obligation of contract clause was the only open-ended federal constitutional guarantee that applied to these states. As such, the obligation of contract clause came by default to be the focal point of litigation for those who sought to protect economic liberties against state intervention. The Supreme Court's interpretation of the clause, uh, both before and after the Civil War, have been filled with odd turns and strange surprises. Now, everyone uh, conceded that the clause applied to ordinary contracts between private persons, including partnerships and corporations. 
And this is exactly why I assumed uh, that this clause should tie in to uh, Assembly Bill 5. However, the Obligation of Contracts Clause also uh, reaches actions by the state so as to prevent it from, repu from repudiating its own contracts, including those that granted legal title of state-owned lands to private persons. Uh, in Fletcher v. Peck, the case from 1810, uh, sought to revoke state charters for private colleges. In Trustees of Dartmouth College v. Woodward in 1819 case, uh, in both instances, Chief Justice John Marshall opted strongly for the broader reading of the clause in order to restrain conduct by government reneging on grants that would be regarded as unacceptable if done by private individuals. In this instance, uh, however, moreover, uh, the broad reach of the ob obligation of contracts clause uh, uneasily coexisted with the principle of sovereign immunity. Uh, which Alexander Hamilton had strongly defended in Federalist No. 81 and 82. That principle prevented the states from being sued for breach of its own ordinary commercial contracts, but that immunity did not allow the states to undo its own contracts once their performance was completed. This reading fits so well with the framers' antipathy to corrupt self-dealings, as well as the general purpose of limited government that to this day, no one has rejected this view of the Obligation of Contracts Clause as how it applies to state contracts. But there remains a spirited debate as to how much protection it supplies in light of the doctrine of sovereign immunity. Certainly, much is to be said on behalf of the stability of titles to property obtained in grants from the states, and it has been universally held that the Contracts Clause does not authorize actions for money damages, but we cannot ignore the reciprocal problem that if the obligation of Contracts Clause is read so broadly as to invite groups to lobby for sweetheart agreements, reformist government would not be able to set such agreements aside. Most of the interpretive questions regarding this clause, however, deal with the impact of the obligations of contracts on the state regulation of private agreements, where the issue of sovereign immunity does not arise. That issue, in turn, is divided into two parts. The first asks whether the obligation of contracts clause protects the rights that are vested in private property contracts that are in existence at the time the state legislates a new regulation uh, that could apply to that contract. The second asks whether the Obligation of Contracts Clause imposes limitations on the power of the state to regulate contracts not yet established. The answer to the first question is relatively uncontroversial. The clause must apply to pre-existing contracts for otherwise it would be a dead letter. Hence, early decisions held that state insolvency could not order the discharge of contracts that were formed before the state statute was passed. Uh, in the case of Sturges v. Cronenshield from 1819, the legislature could not flip the background rules of the legal system to the prejudice of individuals who had advanced money on the faith of earlier agreements. Uh, the clause also applied to a wide range of debtor relief laws, wherein individuals sought to escape or defer their payment of interest to avoid foreclosure on their mortgages during hard economic times. However, uh, it was one thing to say that the Obligation of Contracts Clause applied, and quite another to say that all forms of debtor relief were regarded as beyond the power of the state. Many cases adopted the rather slippery distinction of the Obligation of Contracts Clause uh, as preserving the obligation under contract, but did not prevent the state from limiting one or another remedy otherwise available. And the result was that small erosions of contract rights came to be accepted, but large deviations were not. Even though the clause speaks of all impairments, large or small, in the same breath, Still, uh, in general, the prohibition 
against state intervention into the substance of existing contracts continues to hold today. Unless, as will be discussed later, the state offers some police power justification for its actions. Now, the Supreme Court reached a much more definitive conclusion uh, on the second question in 1827. Uh, in a holding in Ogden v. Saunders, which was a case that split 4-3, with Justice John Marshall and Joseph Story dissenting, that the obligation of contract clause did not apply to those contracts that had not been formed by the date of the passage of the regulatory legislation. In that case, Justice Bushrod Washington, for the majority, made a distinction between laws that affect contracts generally such as statutes of limitations and laws that affect the obligation of contracts. In one sense, Justice Washington's distinction is surely unexceptional, uh, unexceptionable, excuse me. Uh, for it would be odd if a revision of, say, the parole evidence rule of 2000 could not apply to any contract signed before that date. The rule itself does not bias the case one way or another, but it is intended to improve the overall administration of justice. Individuals typically do not rely on these rules at formation either. It would be contrary to its original design to read the obligation of contracts clause as blocking any improvements in the administration of commercial justice. And by the same token, the broad refusal to apply for the obligation of contracts clause prospectively could go too far. For example, suppose a state just announced that from this day forward, it reserved the right to nullify at will any contract that were thereafter formed, and at that point, it would take only a short generation after passage of this statute to gut the obligation of contracts clause, making it mere surplusage. Now, something that is normally not permitted under standard rules of statutory interpretation. Thus, notwithstanding intimations in the convention that it only had retroactive application, the courts have interpreted the clause to hold that its prohibitions are prospective but not absolute. The state may alter the rules governing future contracts in ways that offer greater security and stability in contractual obligations. Procedural legislative reforms that arose most frequently in the early debates uh, a statute of fraud, a state of limitations, a statute of limitations, excuse me, uh, and recording acts are all measures that meet this standard. Now, beyond allowing for procedural changes for future contracts and modifications of remedy for existing contracts, the court's refusal to give the clause any other prospective role opened the way to partisan legislation that limited the ability of some parties to contract without imposing similar restrictions on their economic competitors. In practice, Ogden meant that all general state economic regulation lay outside the scope of constitutional limitation. The gap in the system of constitutional regulation remained until after the Civil War, at which time some protections against state interference with future contracts was supplied by the so-called Dormant Commerce Clause. Uh, this is with respect to interstate agreements only. And this came under uh, the doctrine of the liberty of contract uh, as it was developed under the Due Process Clause and in certain limited cases under the Equal Protection Clauses. But since Ogden, the obligation of contract clause has been an observer and not a central player. In the constitutional struggle to limit prospective state economic regulation, the obligation of contracts clause continued to have the same traction with respect to contracts previously formed, but even in this context, two types of implied limitations on its use were introduced. The just compensation exception, uh, i.e. the Fifth Amendment's takings clause, and the police power exception, now, in principle, the initial question is why any implied terms should be read into any constitutional provision. When no mention of them is made by the framers, uh, I think here the simplest answer is that 
the logic of individual rights and liberties requires that adjustment, that the Constitution thus creates presumptions and leaves it open to interpretation as to how to guarantee uh, those should be qualified in ways that do not gut the original guarantee. Consider first the question of property taken without just compensation. Suppose that A buys land from B, which the government then wishes to condemn with a payment of just compensation. Surely the government's right to condemn is not blocked by A's declaration that he received absolute title to the property from B in a contract that cannot now uh, be impaired by the government. There is, however, a general principle deriving from the common law and the Anglo-American constitutional history that the power to take property for public use is inherent in government. So, that condemnation can go forward even when a person buys the land from the government, such as in the case of West River Bridge Company versus Dix in 1848. Uh, thus, the Obligation and Contracts Clause has to be read subject to a just compensation exception, even though the condemnation can be seen to impair the contract right by denying the owner's rights to hold out for an above-market price. The second set of, expect, uh, of exceptions to the Obligation of Contracts Clause involve the police power. Now, again, this is a power that is nowhere mentioned explicitly in the Constitution, but it is read in connection with every substantive guarantee that it supplies against the exercise of federal or state power. The customary formulation allows the state to override, with, without compensation, private rights of property. Uh, it should, therefore, do so with ordinary contracts as well, Nonetheless, because no compensation is provided, logically, the class of justification should be more stringent than the public use requirement that allows the impairment of contracts with compensation. The canonical formulation uh, defines the state police power as regulation in the name of safety, health, morals, and the general welfare. Stopping contracts to pollute, to bribe, or to fix prices has always been held to fall within the police power exception. Now, the New Deal Constitutional Transformation of 1937, uh, which is actually something I've talked about uh, extensively in another video uh, that it, uh, I say completely objectively was a fantastic video full of great information that everyone should watch. Uh, I'll be putting a link to that video up in the upper right-hand corner in a card right about now, I guarantee you, you will love it or your money back. Anyways, the New Deal Constitutional Transformation of 1937, uh, however, expanded the scope of the police power beyond these limited objectives so that it no longer was possible to distinguish between general welfare and special interests. Home Building and Loan Association versus Blaisdell, a Supreme Court case from 1934, uh, vastly multiplied the police power exceptions to the contractual guarantees offered by the Obligation of Contracts Clause, even when no compensation was supplied. The actual decision dealing with a state-imposed mortgages moratorium could be explained in part as an effort to counter the ruinous effects of deflationary policies, which, in effect, increased in constant dollars the amount of the debts, but the decision itself was cast in broader terms and unleashed many other legislative initiatives that sought to neutralize the protections secured by individual contracts, most notably in the Exxon Corp versus Egerton case in 1983. The court found that the broad societal interest was sufficient to justify a decision to prevent a company from asserting its explicit contractual rights to pass on any increased severance tax to its consumers. So at present, uh, therefore, uh, it is virtually certain that the Supreme Court will find a police power justification for absolutely any piece of special legislation with interest group support 
thereby gutting this clause insofar as it applies to broad classes of existing contracts. Uh, ironically, however, the court has remained more suspicious of government's efforts to use legislation to extricate itself from its own covenants, noting that the obvious risk of self-dealing uh, that this behavior represents. It thus struck down efforts of the Port Authority of New York and of New Jersey to nullify bond covenants uh, that prohibited it from using board proceeds to support mass transit. Uh, this comes from United States Trust Company versus New Jersey, a case from 1977, and uh, in Allied Structural Steel Co. versus Spaninaus in 1978. The court refused to allow Minnesota to impose retroactively more stringent financial obligations on an employer in the winding up of his pension plan. Ironically, the most active use of the contract clause today is over the unresolved issue of the power of state and local government unilaterally to restrict pension benefits with public employees. Both union and non-union and dealing with private contracts, however, the modern age often finds little intellectual respect for freedom of contract or for the sanctity of contracts validly formed. More than any fine point of the law, that initial intellectual predilection explains the lukewarm reception of the obligation of contracts clause as claims in dealing with these private arrangements. Well, that's going to do it for the show today. I really hope that you enjoyed that. Uh, if you did uh, enjoy the show, uh, please take a moment and hit the subscribe button. Uh, I am not putting out videos right now on a regular schedule. I would like to get to doing that eventually. Uh, but for the time being, if you can subscribe to the channel, it lets you know when I release new videos. Uh, and then what I always ask people is if you liked this particular episode, especially, uh, take a minute uh, and just share it with one person you know who you think would also uh, especially like this episode uh, or who uh, maybe you think could be introduced to this information uh, or, or just anything like that. Um, and uh, if you hated the show, uh, go ahead and share it with two people because I am a masochist and your hate gets me off. So anyways, that'll do it for me. Uh, I have been locking a liberal. Uh, this has been categorical imperatives. We have been talking about the contracts clause of the Constitution in California's Assembly Bill 5. So until next time, De Linda S. Cartago.